Liverpool, the Lord Mayor of Bradford, Lady Mayors, Honourable Member of Parliament, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. The awakening that is happening now in the communist enslaved Eastern Europe is confirming really what we have said all along. The communist system is bankrupt. The Russian communist rule has not brought the fulfillment and happiness to the Soviet people. Their lives are as poor now as they were after the October Revolution at the end of First World War. And their spiritual needs are completely denied. The communist ideals are failing to step in and substitute for the religious faith, for family unity, or free social interest groups. This is realized by all who study the political, social and economic factors in the Soviet Union and the communist dominated Eastern Europe, but by no one more than Mikhail Gorbachev, the Soviet president. His perestroika and glasnost policies are designed to bring the Soviet population out of the apathy and stagnation of the oppression years and give the Soviet Union the economical uplift that it so desperately needs. The freedom of speech and free exchange of ideas, he knows, are fundamental requirements if the Soviet economy is to recover at all. This freedom to us comes at a critical time if we are to su survive as nations and people at all. This is particularly true about Latvia, Belarusia and Estonia, where the influx of Russian settlers is making or will make them a minority in their own countries. Long before this, however, and applicable to nearly all non-Russian republics in the USSR, has been the relegation of the native languages of the local peoples by putting Russian language in places of work, schools, shops and social, social functions, denying the particular religious faith that could be described as the national church of each country, and implanting industries that have no bearing on the natural resources and needs of the particular republic. The latter has resulted in huge numbers of mainly Russian laborers being brought in to service the factories, I must add, with considerable privileges over the local people, and a terrific pollution problem because of Moscow's deliberate and criminal lack of making any reasonable provisions for safeguards in this direction. These are the immediate problems that are addressed by our people at home in a desperate attempt to survive as people and nations. But at the far end is an aspiration for freedom and sovereign independence, which is as much alive today in Ukraine and Belarusia as it is in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Georgia or Hungary. Mikhail Gorbachev said recently that there will not be the choice of cessation from the USSR, although the Soviet Constitution, paragraph 52, provides for it. Mr. Gorbachev also, on the day he returned back to Moscow after visiting this country, rushed through severe legislation regarding anti-Soviet activity and contacts with organizations and individuals abroad. He has not even invoked it, but it is there and could be used if required. We do remember so vividly the Chinese example. Mr. Lev Lukyanko, in these premises a week ago, said that the Baltic example has given inspiration to us and non-Russian republics. We are undeterred. Our march to freedom has started. It may be a long march, but one day we shall get there. Of that we are sure. And now it's my honor and pleasure to invite Honorable Gary Waller, Member of Parliament, to speak to us.
Ladies and gentlemen, the world, uh, as we've just heard, is changing fast, and the spirit of democracy uh, is on the move. Developments are taking place which few people could have dreamt of only a short time ago. Uh, almost every year, I have briefly addressed this audience in this hall, uh, and I several times forecast that the spirit of national unity among the captive peoples of Eastern Europe was something that no oppressor could hope to resist. Uh, I do believe that uh, there were many skeptics in those days who thought that uh, this was some idle wish fulfillment, that I was merely expressing the words that my audience wished to hear. When I said that the spirit of a nation uh, was something that could never be quenched, I've no doubt that there were some who believed that I was whistling in the wind. Yet now, more than ever, developments are beginning to prove me right. Of course, there are many contradictory and confusing trends which muddy the water and make it more difficult than ever to look ahead. Some signs are very positive. In Hungary, uh, part of the electrified barbed wire fence along the border with Austria has been dismantled, and already the country is moving towards a free and democratic system in which political parties seek the support of the people. In Poland, the Roman Catholic Church has been legalized for the first time under communist rule. The property and privileges stripped from the church after the last war are being restored. Uh, indeed, only a few weeks ago, millions of Poles turned out in the most democratic election in more than 40 years to reject the Communist Party in a way that nobody could, be, could mistake. Similarly, we've seen the peoples of the Baltic states press for their national identity openly and defiantly. <coughs> On the other hand, if one looks around the world, one is aware of the barbarity with which the, the Chinese regime put down the call for freedom and democracy, which had its focus in Tiananmen Square. Despite the massacre of students who gave their lives during the pro-democracy demonstrations in Beijing, the spirit of democracy has been released. And in their heart of hearts, the old men who still rule China must now know that it can never now be suppressed. Ladies and gentlemen, you can massacre unarmed people, but you cannot massacre an idea. Tanks are not weapons which can ride over hope. Bullets cannot wipe out the yearning which a people have for the future. In Ukraine and the Baltic states too, those who hold the reins of power have affected few signs that they intend to lay them down and yield to the will of the people. Yet simultaneously, we're aware that the majority will never rest until they get their way. Of course, one can never tell how quickly things will happen. It may take years before the people of the captive nations sit in the shade of democracy. And some may reach the goal earlier than others, but achieve that goal, they surely will. Now, among the factors which make this process inevitable, perhaps the communications revolution is the most significant. In days gone by, it often took weeks for news to penetrate the Iron Curtain between East and West, and sometimes it never did. But today, the biggest of big brothers is increasingly helpless against the impact of communications technology. As former President Reagan said recently, information is the oxygen of the modern age. The truth is no longer something which can be resisted. Truth, ladies and gentlemen, is something which the totalitarian state has always feared. The antiquated information system developed all those years ago by Lenin is still used by the Soviet Union and by the countries of the Eastern Bloc. What Lenin did, what he did not and could not anticipate, was technological change. Lenin never foresaw the advent of television, satellite dishes, laser discs, computers, video cassette recorders, fax machines, photocopiers, modems, and tape recorders. How could he know that technology would expand the power of the individual more than the power of the state. Technology makes it increasingly difficult for the state to control the information that its people receive. Trying to stop the flow of information is like trying to stop the flow of a mighty rushing river. 
That, of course, does not stop totalitarian leaders from trying. Before you can buy a typewriter in Romania, you have to obtain a license. And before we get too excited about glasnost in the Soviet Union, let's remember that in April, the Soviet criminal code was revised to make it an offense punishable by up to seven years imprisonment for Soviet citizens to accept printers or copying machines from foreigners. A Soviet state publishing company requires its employees to obtain two signatures and submit what they want to copy before they can use a photocopying machine. So it may take two or three days for permission to be obtained. And not surprisingly, the Soviet Union faces vast difficulties in trying to reform an economy burdened with such hopeless and regressive concepts. For many years now, opposition to the political and economic systems of the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe has been maintained by the circulation of newsletters which have con continued to be published despite the efforts made to suppress them. More recently, similar messages recorded on audio cassettes have been going the rounds to be played by anybody who owned a home recorder for the benefit of themselves and their friends. And the next stage of the process is the development of satellite television. In one or two of the more liberal members of the Warsaw Pact, and ladies and gentlemen, one uses the word liberal only to draw contrast with other more oppressive regimes, it's possible to obtain a permit for a satellite dish. But the majority of states, both within and outside the Soviet Union, in, those, in that majority of states, permission would almost certainly be withheld. But before long, much smaller dishes will come into use, and attempting to forbid the viewing of material from the West will become an almost hopeless task. It's perhaps uh, significant that the jamming of radio broadcasts has reduced considerably during the last year or two, not because of a sudden conversion by the authorities to free speech, but because it has become increasingly clear the resistance was a lost cause. <coughs> Thus, ladies and gentlemen, the tide of history and of technology is moving in the direction of freedom. It's right that the West should be responsive when signs of hope emerge. What we must not do, however, is to throw away our guard in some wild expectation that the Soviets will do likewise. On the contrary, times of change are times which carry the greatest risk. Who knows whether Gorbachev will succeed? There are still plenty of old-style followers of Brezhnev in the bureaucracies surrounding the Kremlin who long for Gorbachev to fail. The USSR remains a state in which the military largely dictates the pace, and there are many generals who profoundly regret everything that Mikhail Gorbachev is attempting to do. So let us therefore keep up our guard, rejecting the advice of those who think that we have nothing to fear from Soviet expansionism. There are too many here who know from bitter experience what a mistake that would be. Let us remember that it is largely the failure of economic development under communism which has led to the desire for change, not a conversion like that of St. Paul on the road to Damascus. Events are moving the course of world history in our direction, but we can help it along by giving our support to those who still anchor after freedom and will not be satisfied till they grasp it. Our role here, all of us, the role of us in Britain, is crucial because the knowledge that we are not prepared to accept the status quo, that we want to see the people of the captive nations controlling their own de destiny, remains vital to them. The spirit that is expressed by you in action and in words, and in your traditional songs and dances, rises high above those who thought that they could one day wipe them out by submerging them by a process of Russification. We know that that can never happen. And I look forward to the day when the name captive nations can be discarded forever as we hold high the flags of the free nations of Europe and of the world. Thank you.
thanks to Gary Waller for a very illustrative speech and comments. Thank you indeed. And now I would like to ask my committee colleague, Ms. Lesia Vassiluk, to read a resolution which we have prepared for today. We, the members of the captive nations, are viewing with concern the recent changes in attitudes of Western statesmen and governments in their dealings with the Soviet Union. The glasnost and perestroika policies of President Gorbachev have brought about a feeling that the Soviet Union is now a country where freedom, human rights and democracy exist. Added to which the Gorbachev's initiative on disarming might suggest that the communists in Moscow have ceased their ambitions for expansion and will settle for peace. This is not so. An unfounded false sense of security could be very costly. We saw on our television screens only last month the Chinese students' demonstration being crushed by the communist rulers in Peking the bloody onslaught by the army, and a swift follow-up with the death penalties. But we have forgotten that the very same action was taken by the Red Army against peaceful demonstrators in Georgia on 9th of April 1989. The soldiers clubbed people with spades, including women and children. The day after he returned from London, Mikhail Gorbachev rushed through legislation which restricts the rights of political opposition to the Soviet system, and in particular provides severe sentences for people with contacts and support from individuals or organisations abroad. The recent elections in Soviet Union, hailed as the first democratic elections there, were so loaded that the Communist Party could not possibly lose. The Republic parliaments in Estonia and Lithuania have passed resolutions for, na for national sovereignty, but the Supreme Soviet of the USSR have blocked these resolutions. Although the Soviet constitution provides for its member republics to leave the USSR if they so decide. We wish to see true freedom in Eastern Europe and therefore urge the Western governments, institutions and trading delegations to make sure that all the agreements and treaties conclude with the Soviet government, insist that Moscow abides by the human rights requirements of the Helsinki Agreement, insist all business deals entered into with Soviet firms and authorities secure their assurances that due regard will be paid to industrial safety. Ecological and environmental considerations by the Soviet counterparts demand that the Berlin Wall is brought down as a precondition for any changes in scientific, technical or social fields. Be cautious when meeting the Soviet requirements for financial support. This financially ailing despotic government, which does not hesitate to turn its army on its own people, if recovered, could turn on you too. Thank you, Lesha, for reading the re uh, resolution. May I now please have your traditional acceptance Hold the resolution, please. Will you raise your hand? Thank you. Against? No. Thank you very much. It's carried. Thank you. We have now completed the official part of this meeting and the concert follows. Now the concert details will be introduced by my colleague Sylvie Billington, if she's anywhere here. Sylvie Billington, please. I didn't spot you.
still yours. Right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This evening's concert begins with the Ukrainian male voice choir Duma from Keithley. Conductor Mr. Yaroslav Homichak. They will be singing two songs. The first song is Promiche, a Cossack song written around 1615 about a hero. And the second song is I High Snow Mayetsha, The Meadow is Still Smiling, written in Rimini during the Second World War. Thank you. Yeah. 